Okay, good afternoon everyone. Um, we're close to the end, or it's the final part of the program of today, and we're close to the end of a very intense two-day meeting, two-day congress, with a lot of information we fired at you. Um, but that's what Fertinoa was all about. It was a lot of information, try to get it together. You've seen the book. Um, we explained as many things as possible from that book to you. And um, in this last uh, part, I'm going to talk to you about um, the final task. It was about reducing the emissions that we have in horticulture, in fertigated horticulture, um, towards the environment. So we did some, we tested some techniques with uh, several partners, and we showcased them throughout the last few years. Um, here you see an oversight. I will quickly go through them, and with the last one, I'll elaborate. Uh, I'll elaborate a bit more because that's one. That's yeah. What's I, what I did, so I know a bit more about that one. Um, from all those techniques that you see here, there are posters outside. So, if you want more detailed information, I urge you to go take a look at the poster. It's, the fi it's your final chance because at the end of this day, they will be removed. So, I urge you really to go to those posters. There will contact details as well. If you can't find it, you can come to me, and I will direct you in the right direction to contact those, these people. The first technique that I wanted to mention to you is um, the removal of sodium uh, using electrodialysis. Um, it was showcased by a partner of the project of uh, Fertinoa called TNO uh, and Wageningen. Um, in electrodialysis, uh, here's a small representation of it, they um, use an electric current to divide um, monovalent ions from a drain water solution. So all monovalent ions ions can get taken out. And the most important one in closed water systems, like in the Netherlands and Belgium are quite frequently, the most important one is sodium. And um, this is one way of dealing with it. Um, there is some waste, and they're looking now how to optimally use that. But um, once the sodium is taken out, the remaining big water volume is something they can start reusing again. So it is limiting the amount of discharge water on a drastic level. The next one um, that the same partner, also TNO, showed was uh, the use of photocalytic uh, materials. Um, and um, this is actually quite interesting. So this graph here shows you a titanium dioxide layer that you can spray on top of any surface. And um, the titanium dioxide layer if it comes in contact with drain water that contains, for instance, plant protection products or any organic material that you want to get rid of, in the influence of sunlight, it will bound all those um, organic agents. So it will take them out of the water. So also, plant protection, it was the, the main aim for this technique was to remove the plant production products from drain water. And it seems to be um, a new technique, but it has some promise to it. Um, they are working now in a legislation part of it because they were asked some questions. Hopefully, they will get them figured out because this technique is something that can be very um, interesting. The next one was called EFOS. It's um, a technique within cooperation between two partners of Fertinoa. Uh, the one who showcased it was PCS. The one who developed the machine was called Fraunhofer in Germany. Um, also here I have a simple graph of it. So um, it was tested in ornamentals. Um, the drain water of ornamentals contains a lot of um, phosphates, and um, the amount of phosphates is too large to be able to discharge the drain water. So it has to be... Um, dealt with, and the phosphate has to be taken out before we can think about discharging the water. Discharging the water. And the EFOS, um, there is some filtration steps before you can use the EFOS, but this is the EFOS itself, so the drain water can go through it, and with a cathode and an anode, you can split it up. Adding some magnesium will cause precipitation of the phosphate in the form of struvite. And struvite is essentially also a fertilizer. So it's a very effective way of taking out almost all of the phosphates. So the phosphate levels of this water is reduced to almost nothing anymore. And uh, that's what the EFOS is about.
going on to the next uh, technique that we tested was um, in closed um, water systems, the drain water needs to be filtered. And especially when we work with um, um, substrates that are not um, like rock wool, but are organic, that are rich in particles, and that will dissolve in the drain water, so we'll, that will be submerged in the drain water, filtration becomes very, very important. Um, in a closed water system, it's all highly recommended to use disinfection methods, and disinfection can only be um, successful if pre-filtration is adequate. Here you see an example of a closed or semi-closed water system. And the special thing about this is that this is an open air field. So it's a substrate cultivation, but it's an open air. So it's um, exposed to rainfall. And the uh, amount of rainfall can cause dramatic amounts or large amounts of drain water that we have to be able to deal with. And uh, this closed water system or semi-closed water system is equipped to deal with large amounts of drain water on a very efficient way. Um, the problem is, for, for now, is that between this drain silo and the disinfection unit, in this case a slow sand filtration unit, in order to have a successful disinfection, you need pre-filtration that is good. And um, within Fertinoa, we searched for techniques that have no back flush, because we don't want any excess water that we have to discharge. So we want to be able to use as much as water as possible without discharging it to the natural waters. And we found two techniques that seemed to be very promising, and I showed them to you here. This is a sieve band filtration, and the principle is very easy. So you pump the water on top of the sieve band, it's just a band, and the band has small um, um, slots in it. And the uh, slots are only 150 micrometers wide, so every particle that's bigger than that size will be held back on the sieve, like you see here. And the, the remaining particles will drop off, the water will run through, and will be more, um, use, it will be more um, manageable by the disinfection unit. Another one, this one goes even finer, is the paper band filtration. Paper band is, like the word says, it uses a paper, and uh, water will mount on top of it, and the water will progress through, and all particles larger than the mace width of the, par of the paper will stay on top and will clog up the paper. So once the paper is completely full, um, a sensor will be um, um, alerted and the paper will move. So you see here at the end the paper roll and it will just roll off and the next clean piece of paper will be exposed to the drain water that runs on top of it. You can go as fine as five micrometers with this system. Um, most of the growers in Belgium, where I live, uh, use paper band filtrations with paper of 20 micrometers. So it's already very, very fine. Those two techniques don't produce any backwash water, and I can't express that enough. Uh, a lot of filtration devices have back flush water, a uh, back flush water, and it's something you have to deal with. So you have to store it. Uh, people will have to come and get it. Um, or you have to spread it around, but it's always a fuss. So it's always very difficult to convince, legislation-wise, um, a good way of dealing with it. So try to avoid it as much as possible. The final one, um, previously, one of, with one of the previous speakers, it was Joris, I think, he got a question from the audience from what are the advices you give to your growers um, how to deal with um, um, when you have, like, for instance, high remnants of nitrogen in the, in the soil. And um, I will give you an example how we deal with those problems, uh, how we give advice to growers to deal with those excessive uh, remnants of nitrogen in the soil. Uh, it's based on a very old system. Uh, it's a German system. It's called KNS. And um, it takes into account both the amount of nitrogen that's in the soil at present, but also what will be released by, with um, mineralization, with uh, naturally occurring mineralization. And um, we try to use an, um, a new, like, a new um, mandatory practice that the growers have to do in Belgium. We try to use it, and it's soil sampling. So every grower in Belgium 
um, every soil cultivating grower in Belgium needs to take soil samples and um, he needs to prove to the government that he's in order with legislation, European legislation. So he needs to try to stay lower than the 90 kilograms of nitrate, uh, nitrogen, uh, 90 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. Um, at the moment, a lot, of grow, a lot of the Belgian growers are higher than this number. So they are looking for systems that are very cheap, possibly free, um, to deal with this problem and how to fertigate on a very um, clever way to get beneath this norm that the Europe, Europe is now imposing. Here you see an analy analysis result of such a um, of such a soil sample, and uh, I highlighted the nitrogen part, and you see here that this sample is much higher than the 90 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. So this should be, this will be a problem if, the, if we put this sample to the um, legislation uh, people in Belgium. So, KNS, it takes into account the soil sampling, so the actual end content, but also the expected end, con end content, so it's the mineralization rate. And at my research center, it's uh, short, the abbreviation is PCH, um, we followed up the mineralization rate throughout the year in those plastic beds. So I work in strawberry, here you see a strawberry crop, and in those plastic beds, you see the, due to the mineralization rate, the amount of nitrogen is building up, building up, building up throughout the year. And you see this progressive line between April and August, a progressive line of amounting amount or, or rising amounts of um, nitrogen. And if we calculate it, it will be six kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per week. So it's quite a large amount of uh, nitrogen that we get from nature into our beds. So that's something we have to think about because if we fertilize without taking this uh, mineralization rate into account, it will stay in our soil. And if we take at the end of the year our mandatory soil sample that we have to send in, quite often we have high levels of nitrogen in our, in our soils. So at our research center, within Fertinoa, we started to do um, demonstrative um, cultivations based on KNS, comparing it to another field based on just adding all the nutrients that the plant would need without taking into account what is in the soil and what the mineralization will do. So we started comparing those two fields just to show the growers what will happen if we do um, KNS or not. So it's, there are some, some cultivation um, specifics here, um, but the main goals are to reduce the end content at the end of the cultivation. And of course, we have to maintain production and fruit quality. And um, the next slide will show you the KNS table. It's not difficult. Um, it maybe will look difficult with all the arrows and, and all the uh, numbers, but it's not. Um, we have a fixed mineralization rate. Just on the previous slide, I showed you with six kilograms of nitrogen per week. So this is something we take into account. We need, of course, the entire plant need of the crop. That's what we aim to give. But we, have, we subtract the mineralization and what we find in the soil. So we take two soil samples within the crop, and in the first sample, in this case, there was 86 kilograms of nitri nitrogen uh, in the soil. In the second sample, a few weeks later, it was only 50. So taking those numbers into account, we can calculate what we have to give. And you see here the weekly numbers we have to add to our crop. Yeah, yeah, that's just fine, yeah, that's just fine. Here you see the weekly numbers, and uh, it's much lower than the plant need because the mineralization will add to those numbers that you see here. And at the end of the cultivation, you see that if we would add everything, at the end of the cultivation, we would have 164 kilograms of nitrogen in the soil. With KNS, it's only 24. If we take a soil sample, I would really like to give this to our government. And for production and quality, there was no problem whatsoever. Here you see the harvest pattern is just the same between if we give everything to the plants or if we use the KNS strategy. So that works actually pretty fine. Okay, that was my thing about KNS.